Good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning as we uh, continue in our worship, as we look, uh, as we continue in our sermon series about the names of God. Uh, we will be looking at Jehovah Shalom today and uh, all that that means. And so uh, we ask that if maybe you are visiting with us for the first time that you take that bulletin. There's a little slip of paper there that you can fill out your information on and tear it off. Let me see if I can do that, see if I'm coordinating. Tear it off and then put it in the offering plate later on when that comes by. Or if you have a prayer request or a concern or praise, we love the praises too, uh, you can put that on one side, put that in the offering plate and we'd love to... Uh, to share that on our prayer list and to, as your staff, to, to pray about those. And so with that said, let us continue to worship him in spirit and in truth this morning. Good morning. I want, again, I want to welcome y'all to Bethany Christian, and it's great to be in the house of the Lord, especially in as many years as Don and I have been, right? Would you uh, help me with a responsive me reading this morning? It is good to sing praises to our God. God is gracious, and song of praise is fitting. Praise is the Lord, and abundant in power, whose understanding is beyond measure. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God with a lyre. Give pleasure in those who fear you, and hope in your steadfast love. Let us pray. Great God of the universe, you set the stars on, cor on course in the heavens. The earth radiates your glory and honor. The rain never falls without you knowing it. The fields produce their harvest according to your design. We admire the strength by which you rule the nations. We bow down in adoration on how you care for your children. We gather gladly to herald your encompassing acts of goodwill. Hear us as we respond by giving you praise. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. Father God, you are worthy. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our praise, our adoration, our love. God, you have bestowed upon us the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness and mercy, and we ask that you empower us to spread uh, that feeling to others, to spread that love to others, to spread forgiveness, and to forgive others as we have been forgiven. God, I just uh, thank you that we are in your house this morning where we can come and worship you, and we are uh, with uh, fellow uh, seekers of, of Christ, fellow followers of Christ, and that we can... Uh, encourage one another as family. Uh, I thank you for Bethany. It's my church family and they are special to me. I thank you for all of God's kingdom and all those that have gathered this morning to worship you around our city in Odessa and all those that, that need to know you. And God, I pray that you would revive your church uh, for a world that is in need of you. And God, we just thank you for all your blessings upon us we give you praise, glory, and honor. For this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we do each week, as we take the Lord's Supper, the remembrance that he has uh, set before us, here at Bethany we practice what is called open communion. You don't have to be a member of the church to participate in this act of worship with us. You just have to be one who, who is, is following Christ, seeking Christ, seeking Jesus. As, as uh, maybe Jesus, and look, you don't have to be looking for Waldo, but you can be seeking Jesus. And uh, just remembering what, what the bread represents, the body of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the blood, uh, the, the juice that we take representing the life of uh, of Christ poured out, shed uh, for, for our sakes. And it is these things, these remembrance that we do each and every week that proclaims we are part of the body of Christ, that we are part of the church of Christ. We are disciples of Christ. So let us do this in remembrance of him as we take the elements. And Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. Creator God, 
We glimpse your power and majesty and the beauty of the winter skies. We glimpse your providence and care in our rich land. We glimpse your creativity and promise in the face of a newborn child. But it is when we come to this table and break this bread that we see what is most special. Your self-sacrificing love for us, your children. Thank you that your love is revealed in us in breaking bread. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right then. And then he took the cup and he blessed it. We continue in prayer, O God of life, affirming that you sent Jesus to draw us toward life abundant. As we prepare to drink this cup, we remember how your love was revealed in Jesus Christ's witness and words, suffering and sacrifice in the living Christ, who dwells among us and within. Our cup overflows with goodness and mercy as we share this cup of life. Let your glory be revealed as we pray and meditate. In Jesus' name. Amen. Having remembered our Lord and his sacrifice on the cross through the observance of communion, we come to that time in our worship service where we give back to him through our, our financial givings, our offerings. And uh, But uh, here at Bethany we have a a practice that as, as we are doing the financial offering, we're remembering all of our offerings to the Lord, which all of our offerings of our time, our efforts, our energy, our devotion, and all of these things uh, that are uh, an act of worship unto him. Scripture says that we are to be cheerful givers, that we are to give cheerfully, uh, not just to God, and his church and his purposes, but to one another and family and those in needs. So let us be cheerful givers this morning as we worship God through the offering. Father God, we praise you for your blessings that you have given to us, and we return a portion of those blessings uh, to you, a portion through our financial giving, a portion through our life lived for you, uh, through our service for you, God. Let us be cheerful givers. Let us be faithful servants of you as you have been faithful to us. And we give you praise, glory, and honor. And as we come to the time when we break open your word today, that you would speak to us in a mighty way. For this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Many of us have uh, fallen victims to uh, the... Um, Fallen victims to the uh, the flu bug that seems to be going around and uh, is uh, hitting us quite a bit, and so um, and I also know there are several of our youth that have been out. Uh, uh, AJ and Justin were at a competition in El Paso, and so they're out, and so several of our people are out. But at the same time, it is still good to be in God's house, and we have some people here that that have been out out for a while that we're glad that they have come back. Uh, uh, Ginger, we're glad that you're back amongst, amongst the living, so to speak, amongst us, you know, she, uh, she's finally here and so we, we enjoy that. It's good to have Delaney and, and Sean and, and Garrett back with us and, and so just, um, and uh, uh, it is good to be, um, to have some of the family that was missing to come back and, and Bethany is a, is a family. Uh, to me and hopefully it is to you and uh, I think it's unique in, in, uh, in, in that respect and so we have been looking at the names of God this week and uh, this last couple of weeks and we have examined uh, as Moses encountered God and what that meant and the names that, that he found and the character of God we have looked at uh, Jehovah Yahweh we have looked at um, um, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, and today we're looking at Jehovah Shalom. Okay, we're, uh, this is, uh, and, and why, why, why are the names of God so important? Because the names, as found in the Old Testament, are the first revealings of the very character of God. You see, the Bible is God's self-revelation of himself to his creation, to us, okay? And why do we need God to reveal himself to us? Because uh, most of us, 
uh, have, have, well, all of us actually, this side of, of the cross, were born, well, this side of the Garden of Eden, to be honest, were born into a world that has sin. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So therefore, sin separates us from God, and the separation keeps us from knowing God to the full extent. And so God seeks after us as we should seek after him. So we're going to be looking at Judges 6, 1 through 24 today. We're going to hit some of those. Uh, like I said, the name we're looking at is Jehovah Shalom. And that name carries with it the idea of peace. Uh, shalom is a word that is used, uh, it's a Jewish word. It's used for uh, a lot of things. And a lot of times I used to think for the longest time it meant hello and goodbye because they would say shalom when they would see you and shalom when they left. But shalom carries with it the idea of peace. Okay, but not peace, uh, and even, even just that one word is not, doesn't give its true meaning. It's the idea of inner peace amongst outer conflict. A settled peace in an unsettled world. A peace of being anchored, of being content, of being part of God and who he is. We live in a culture of fear. You don't believe that? Just pick up a newspaper. Um, this last week we had family promise here, and, and uh, I was an overnight host. And uh, since we had the break in here a couple of weeks ago, you know, I used to be an overnight host, and I wouldn't think anything about it. I'd sleep uh, in the church. we have done lock-ins. I never thought about it. But you know, after that break-in, every little sound made me jump. Yeah, I was a little paranoid because of what had happened. It's fear. If you've ever experienced a personal break-in at your house, which we have, you have that fear that somebody's going to break in. If you've ever had your one of those bosses that like to come and look over your shoulder, you know what I mean? I used to have one of those. I had this fear. I always was going. The world can be a fearful place. After 9-11, we have been fearful of terrorist attacks. There's the fear of crime. There's the fear of abuse. There's the fear of abandonment. There's the fear of rejection. A fear of hunger. A fear of poverty. A fear of homelessness. A couple weeks back, we took the youth on a retreat, and, and the topic was facing your fears. And people, I've got news for you. Fear is not just an adult issue. It goes all the way down. It permeates our world. It has been stated that the only sense of community we have now is a shared fear or anxiety. Victims of this, victims of that, victims. We have a, a sense of community because of our fears. So as we turn to Judges 6, Israel, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people can certainly relate to our times today. You see, their world was in chaos. The Midianites were oppressing them. The Midianites were a, a group of people that had this kind of hit and run tactic. They would uh, do what is called raids, and they would come in. They'd raid and they'd take all. You know, they'd raid during the harvest as you were collecting the harvest, and they'd take all the food away. They'd raid uh, as uh, at a festival, and they'd take all. The, and so they would, they would swoop in, take what you had, and leave you with nothing. Okay, sounds a lot like life, doesn't it? You know, we are blindsided by a lot of things sometimes that swoop in seem to take everything we have and leave us with nothing. So we can definitely relate to this. Okay? So, let's look at Judges 6. The people, verse 1, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens uh, that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites 
and the people from the east would come up against him. They would encamp against him and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep, ox, or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents and they would come like locusts in number. Sometimes the problems in the world seem to overpower us, don't they? You ever notice in your own life, you, you, you have, a, problems don't come just one at a time, do they? I used to drive an old car, we, we drove a car and we were poor and, uh, we're not much different now, but, uh, you know, we were poor and, and I had this thing, I was like, somebody would say, well, you know, your windshield wiper's not working. I was like, yeah, but if I fix it, something else will break. Okay, did you ever have that feeling? It's like, if I, if I, if I do this, something else is going to compound. Okay, one problem, they don't hit just one at a time, do they? It seems like they hit once, and then they hit, and hit, and hit, and hit. And so Israel found itself in that situation. Let's look at 7 through 10. And when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I have delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of those who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why were they being punished? Why were they having problems? Perhaps the Israelites were even asking, hey, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to us? Aren't we supposed to be God's special people? Why are Christians persecuted around the world? Aren't they supposed to have a great relationship with God? Why does this happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, sometimes it's because we, as God's people, have not been obedient to him. Not always, but this case it was. You see, maybe they were accusing God of abandoning them when, in fact, it was the other way around. Sometimes we accuse God of not hearing our prayers when we haven't actually truly sought after him. Sometimes we accuse God of not being involved in our lives when we haven't been involved in the life and the service of the church and we haven't been involved in God's life. You see, they had stopped worshiping God and were worshiping other gods, other things. It was Israel that had abandoned God and not the other way around. They were being terrorized by the Midianites because they were living outside the will of God. Here's a life truth. We may not like it, but it's supported by Scripture, I believe. And I have found it in my own per personal life to be true. When you live outside of the will of God, expect some turmoil. Now, it doesn't mean when you're in the will of God that you'll be Without problems, yes, we'll have problems. But when we're in the will of God, we have that shalom, that inner peace, when outside there is conflict. When I'm not in a right relationship with God, the outside conflict, the inside conflict, wind up being the same thing. They match. But you know what? Even in our conflict, even in our disobedience, God seeks to deliver us. Hear that. If you hear nothing else today, hear that. Maybe you're having some problems. Maybe you're, you know, and the, and the last thing you need to hear is some preacher saying, it's because you're being disobedient to God that you're having those problems. Hear this. Even if you are disobedient to God, even if you are having that problem because of your actions, know this. God seeks to deliver you. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son to die on the cross for us. When did he send our son? When we were... No, he sent, he sent his son. I said our... He sent his son 
when we were disobedient, when we were sinful. Okay, God seeks after you. Have hope. God seeks to deliver. Let's look at verse 11 and 12. Now the angel of the Lord came and said under a terebinth, that's a kind of tree, I have no idea what it is. Terebinth at, at Ophrah, uh, which belonged to Joash the Abazite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midians. And, uh, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, then why has this happened to us? And where are all the wonderful deeds that our fathers uh, recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hands of, the, of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. You see, here's the thing. God comes to Gideon, and Gideon is hiding, and, and he's... he's uh, threshing out the wheat and he's doing it in, in the wine press a, a depressed area so that nobody see it and you kind of get the image I get the image that you know he peeks his head up every now and then and looks make sure nobody's in, and then he's working down here why because he doesn't want what little they have to be stolen okay and God comes to him and God calls him God is often working behind the scenes to provide deliverance if we will just trust in him See, God uses the unlikely. He calls Gideon. Small, little Gideon. And Gideon, what does God say? He says, um, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Here is a guy hiding in a pit, being a scaredy cat, and God says to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty warrior. And then he, he, he smarts off and said, well, if the Lord is with us, why has he abandoned us? Why has all of this happened? And God says to him, it has happened so that I can send, basically, a deliverer. Have I not sent you? See, that's the problem with us sometimes in our world. We want to gripe about all that's going on and say, if God would really move, somebody, he would call somebody to do something about this mess. And God is saying, I've called you, O mighty man of valor. You see, Gideon, let's see what does he do. What does he do next? He says, um, okay, hang on. Did not, uh, uh, do, do not I say, and he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that, the, uh, that it is you who speak to me. Okay, and then he, he gets his sign. Basically, Gideon says, How can it be? I'm, I'm from the smallest clan, and I'm the smallest, you know, of, of my father's kids. I don't look like a mighty warrior. I can't do that. Remember? Moses was called to a great task, and his excuse was, I can't speak. I stumble over my words. Gideon is called. Guess what? God has this tendency to use people that we think are unworthy or, or not, not good enough to the task. If you're like me, who ha I, I'm, I've shared this. I've always struggled with my own self-image. Okay? I'm not good enough, or I'm not this enough, or I'm not that enough, okay? But here's what God says. God says, I don't care what you think you are by yourself. With me by your side, you are enough. Bethany Christian Church, we might say, hey, how can we reach those? How can, how can, we, how can we minister to those? How can we do... You know, we're small. Yes, we are small. And there's some things that God has called us as a small church to do that a large church can't do. Okay? 
There's some ministry that he has called us to do. But God has promised us his presence, just as he has promised Gideon. You see, that's where the difference is. God, God uses the unlikely small Gideon. Uh, he's the Lord's mighty warrior. He pronounces him as a mighty warrior before Gideon sees that. Um, God's response is of his promised presence. In verse 13, he says, okay, verse I've got to get some better glance. And Gideon said to him, please, sir, if God, if the Lord is with us, why then has this all happened? And where are all his wonderful deeds? Da, 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 da. And then down here it says, but now the Lord has forsaken us, give, given us to the Midianites. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? If God sends you, he's going to be with you. See, this is God's call to Gideon. God's calling can overcome any excuse you have. God's calling can overcome any struggle you have. See, with God, you can do all things. With God, we can do all things. Okay? It doesn't mean that Gideon immediately that next day stepped out of the pit and was able to solve the whole thing but it meant in the process of doing it. Sometimes we have to. What do we got to do when we learn it? We, we have to crawl first, then we have to walk, and then we have to, uh, to run. But know that God is in each and every part of that process. God has called you to a task or an act, but you have made excuses. God calls all of us to tasks and things that he wants us to do, but we've made excuses. God called me to ministry when I was in high school. He said he wanted me to, to be a minister. And I said, no, God, I don't want to be a minister. They're poor. That's why I'm taking accounting. I want to be an accountant. Accountants are rich. Okay. Could you tell who my God was at that point in time? I was more concerned about money and luxury in life than I was about obedience to God. Let me give you a hint. God calls you to something, and you tell him no, guess what? That calling doesn't go away. He's going to come back and ask you to do that. And he'll come back. And he came back later on in my life and reminded me of that calling. He doesn't waste the experience you have in between, I don't believe. My training to be an accountant and serving as an accountant and all that has, has been useful in the ministry that's, that God has called me to. But my calling on my life goes back to when I was in high school. I did a little bit of the Jonah thing. I ran from the calling. And I had to go through a lot of... Because guess what? When you're not in the will of God, expect turmoil. That's that life truth I just mentioned. And so we had turmoil. You see, Gideon's story sounds familiar to me. It resonates with my heart because uh, it, I identify with it. I identify with it because I don't think I'm good enough for the task of what God has called me to, to be. I have a fear of rejection. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary, the founder of the China Inland Mission, said... All of God's great men and women have been weak people who do great things for God because they counted on his being with them. Have you counted on God's presence in your daily life? Teachers, y'all are doing a great work. That is a calling on your life. But have we forgotten that God has counted on us? It, it can be there. You can count on God to be with you in that classroom. I don't care what the state says about no, no prayer or no God in, in the schools. God is in the school. God is there. He will be with you. Husbands, wives, those of you that are, that are trying to, to eke out a living, workers, God is in that. Scripture tells us that whatever work we find ourselves, we are to do it as unto the Lord. That it be an honor unto God. Okay? And so whatever that task is, raising children, raising uh, 
caring for parents, caring for Ill, uh, spouses with illness. All these things are tasks that God has called us to. All these things are things that we may or may not feel up to. I talked with Dave Baum last night. Um, Y'all know Dave. He's, he's, he's one of our founding members, and, and, and Glenn's not doing real, real well. And, and I, I just kind of heard in Dave's voice just a, a despair of, uh, you know, I'm not sure I can make it, you know, I'm sitting here watching my spouse decline and decline. As somebody who has, who has who's had a spouse that has had uh, illness most of our married life, it can be hard. But here's the thing. God doesn't call us to do those things by ourselves, does he? God doesn't call you to walk the Christian walk by yourself and of your own power. God says, hail, O mighty one of valor. He pronounces his blessing over you. He pronounces his blessing over you. And when he pronounces that blessing over you, we can say... As Gideon did when he prepared the altar uh, for God, and he pronounces that name that we call Jehovah Shalom. We can have peace that God is there in all areas of our life. You see, we are like Gideon when we really need peace. See, what, he really, what was real, he really needed was peace, but what we really need is that inner peace also. We're not necessarily going to ever have a world that gets along. I don't think we'll ever have a world without war. I don't think we'll ever have a world where people don't oppress one another. Jehovah Shalom, we need peace. We need peace with God, and we need peace from God you see God gives us peace there are some things we can't do without his divine interaction or divine touch or divine presence or his movement of his spirit in our lives peace does not mean the absence of conflict see God was calling Gideon to battle a battlefield is anything but peaceful In John 12, 27, Jesus spoke of the peace he had as he faced the cruel cross. And he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Since we often equate peace with the absence of conflict, we tend to want to avoid conflict. That's kind of an impossible task. Have y'all had any luck avoiding conflict lately? Well, I'll just get off of Facebook, and then I'll have no conflict at all. Well, you, you'll probably decrease a lot of conflict in your life that way, but there'll still be conflict in your life. Well, I just won't discuss uh, politics. Well, guess what? You're still going to have conflict in your life. Well, I, don't, I, I won't discuss religion. You're still going to have conflict in your life. I won't... Uh, I just won't get married. Then I won't have any conflict in my life. Well, you probably won't have as much, but you're still going to have conflict in your life. I want, that wasn't our personal. Okay. Uh, but conflict is part of life. We went on a youth trip, and there was a little bit of drama. We did youth camp. There was a little bit of drama. And we're like, this is once we're like, well, how can we, how can we deal with this wrong? Guess what? Drama is part of human nature. Church has dramas. Families have drama. I'm reminded of y'all ever see the, um, what is that, um, um, the movie, the the Music Man? Y'all ever see that? The Music Man. The guy comes to town, and he. He, he, he wants to sell musical instruments, so he, he, he decides that he's going he's gonna to stir the whole community up against the evils of playing pool so that they'll buy all these instruments to put their kids in band to spare them from the evils of pool. Because look at pool. Look at that. It's horrible. It's here. It's the, the worst, terrible thing. And it's, 
It starts with a P and double O and an L. You know, I love the line, but the thing is, when we focus on trouble, we're not focusing on the Lord. And the solution to the Lord, the solution to trouble is the Lord. Man, I have been tongue-tied like crazy the last couple of weeks. The solution of trouble is the Lord. The solution of unhappiness is the Lord. The solution of sinfulness is the Lord. And when we count on him, and when we receive his peace. See, sometimes we try to avoid conflict to get peace, so we change jobs. We change schools. We change spouses. We change cars. We change whatever it is to avoid it, to bring peace. But we won't find it. Peace is not found in a change of circumstance or venue. Peace is found within. When our peace, inner peace, is anchored in a relationship with Jesus Christ, then nothing can take away our peace, not even the turmoil of this world. Is your peace anchored in Jesus Christ? Have you experienced Jehovah Shalom? Maybe you're like me and you turned your life over to Jesus Christ when you were young. But there have been troubled times and, and there have been times that I have needed to renew my relationship with Jesus Christ. That I have needed to re-strengthen and refocus and turn my attention to him. Kind of like a marriage relationship. If I don't give, ever give my wife any attention our marriage relationship is going to decline. Some people come to me, they want, my marriage is in shambles, how do I fix it? Okay, you got to focus not so much on the problems as the person. Learn to love. Learn to, to, to give. Learn to serve. Learn to be that. Maybe, I, I hear a lot of times of people that have been burnt by the church and have had problems with the church well guess what come to the church we're not perfect come to the church don't look to the church to solve your problem look to Jesus to solve your problem but it's within the expression of the church that Jesus promises Jesus calls it the church his, 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 the bride the bride of Christ so come back into relationship. So we're coming to our, our invitation time. Maybe you need to come back into relationship or, or need to renew your life. You can do that through prayer and just asking God, hey, God, help me to be like Gideon to realize that you have promised to be with me and to walk in faith that you are there. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'd love to talk to you about that and all that that entails. Maybe you're looking for a church home. I can... I can not recommend any greater church than Bethany Christian Church. I cannot recommend any more flawed church than Bethany Christian Church. What? Did you just say that? Yeah, guess what? Their pastor has flaws. Their building, building's got flaws. Everything's got flaws. Why? Because we're, we're a work in process. But guess what? We love Jesus and we'll love you. Because if you're looking for a perfect church, you won't find one. If you're looking for a perfect church and you want to join that perfect church, then you just ruined it. What? Yeah, I had some churches told me that. I was like, well, okay, then that be that way. But it's the truth. God called who? Who did he call? He called Gideon, the smallest church weakest, puniest guy. When he went to the beach, people would kick sand in his face. And he called him, who? To deliver his people. Invitation time. I don't know what God's calling you to do, but now's the time. Let us stand.